Hello, celebrity <laughs> gossip enthusiast. I'm Us Weekly's entertainment director, Travis Cronin, and you're listening to Us Weekly's Hot Hollywood Podcast. Today, I am, as always, I am so excited to be joined by my two co-hosts, Hair Tigress, Gwen Flamberg. Oh, I am a hair tigress. Thank you. Yes, that was from an autocorrect that, you know, she'll always be known as hair tigress now. (laughs) That's correct. And baby girl hair kittress, Sarah Huron. Wow. I don't know what's going on today, but hi, Travis. How are you? (laughs) Oh, good. A little unhinged, which is good because today we are talking about unhinged celebrities. We have some dramatic selfies, a funny man's funeral, royals in war, um, in court, slut shaming in the skies, and much, much more. But before we get into that, let us go around and see what our hosts were just really shocked by this week and what made them go whoa. Gwen Flamberg, what made you go whoa this week? Well, guys, you know, the fashion industry lost a legend, Andre Leon Talley, who was a Vogue editor for many, many years, um, not not as of late, but um, passed away at 73 years old. It is a tragic loss for the fashion industry. But what made me go, whoa, is that Vogue, where he had spent probably the, the most formative part of his career, didn't post um, at the same time as every other outlet was posting about Andre Leon Talley's death and about his incredible career and about how he inspired um, legions of people. Um, And people surmised that it was because of the feud that he had had with Anna Wintour. He famously wrote a memoir called In the Chiffon Trenches, where he kind of trashed um, Anna and, um, you know, spoke about how he felt disrespected by her and by Vogue. So anyway, Vogue did make a statement. Anna Wintour made a statement where she acknowledged that, um, you know, in recent years, there were some challenges, which was very honest and very authentic. Um, But still, the whole situation made me go, whoa. You guys can um, read all about it, of course, on usmagazine.com slash stylish. But Andre Talley, Andre Leon Talley, uh, rest in peace. He will be missed. It's ANTM legend, Andre Leon Talley, and so much more. Sarah Huron, what made you go whoa this week? Well, I mean, quick shout out. You know, I get all my fashion knowledge from The Hills. And um, he was <laughs> on an episode of The Hills and <laughs> when Whitney Port fell down the stairs on Good Morning America wearing oh, a Hillary Swank God, million yes. dollar baby Oscar dress. And he was so kind to Whitney Port in that moment of support. So that's how I remember him. And I feel like that's a good memory. Um, again, my, all my fashion knowledge comes from someone who appeared on MTV. Or that explains the denim the skirts and the Uggs. Yes, it does. Yeah, for sure. I actually just got a pair of Ugg slippers for Christmas. I heard they're back. Um, Laura yeah, Conrad told me so personally. <laughs> um, anyway, my woe this week is about cheer. Um, I don't know if you guys have watched season two yet. It is quite dark. Um, the first half is pre-pandemic, pre-Jerry allegations, business as yeah. usual at Daytona, besides the fact that they're all superstars now. So it's more like exploring influencer-ness and cheerleading. Then we get halfway through shut down Jerry, dark, 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 dark. Then we pick up with the cheer squad who was back the year after. So it's like quite a bit of time that was filmed. Um, and I think it was worth watching again, dark, not quite as uplifting as the first season <laughs> of cheer. Things um, have happened. Things, things have happened. Yeah. Things have gone on. And I just thought it was interesting that a report came out this week about the salary details of cheer. And I'm always interested in salaries. And according to variety, um, both Navarro and their rival Trinity Valley community college, who are heavily featured in season two, were only paid $30,000 for their participant um, participation in the show. Apparently in 2018, Navarro signed a deal with a production company in which the school agreed to be paid $30,000 for the rights to film a season of a then untitled cheerleading documentary. The pact has a built-in exclusive option for cheer producers to renew at the same three um, $30,000 fee each year for five additional academic years, giving the production company exclusive rights to film and exploit the cheerleading athletics athletics as part of the series during the contract period. So um, Navarro's director of marketing said, quote, everybody thinks we made millions of dollars off the show. And as you can see from the contract, we did not. Um, that's like pretty insane. So I'm not, I don't know if just Navarro got the uh, $30,000. Does that mean like the kids weren't paid at all? 
I bet the kids weren't paid at all. I bet Trinity got like $10,000. But you saw how happy she was to get that $20,000 check from Ellen Ellen and still couldn't afford to do a lot of things in her program. So, I mean, Reality Star is notoriously underpaid on every show. Most, uh, save a few housewives, you'll be surprised at everyone's salary. Especially, but this is just interesting because like I know they were, some of them are, I guess they're not really minors because they're in like community college or whatever. But um, these kids, I mean, they pretty much, pour it all out on the show and for them to not get paid is unfortunate and you know there's always debates with like athletes college athletes should they be paid right. it's another example of that but I guess I mean they, this explored in the show the mainstay or like your Gabby Butler your Lexi or Morgan I mean they have like millions of followers now so I guess they got paid in that sense and they explore that yeah. on the show which I thought was interesting sometimes reality shows kind of ignore the fact that the stars are now famous and it's silly to be fighting over like the job they are pretending to have so I liked <laughs> that but I also think they got screwed like what a bad deal they signed it's just such and if you haven't watched it it's such a dramatic show it's really about like the hard lives of people and I just can't believe I care about basket tosses so much when I'm watching that show it's the most important thing to me in the world if her toes are pointed during her you know back full twist just wait until Daytona because it's something that you know so few people can do and so Gabby forever you know I don't begrudge any of those influencer dollars she's making but I, I do find it interesting if the kids aren't getting paid at all, that's a little exploitive. Yeah. They dive really deep into their personal stories. A little exploitive Netflix. Mm, you got to make your own money, kids, on the other side. Good luck, <laughs> Sugar Bear Hair Care, Fab Fit Fun Boxes. That is your payment. Um, well, my biggest woe of the week was Holly Madison, who I thought she was done talking about how terrible the Playboy Mansion was and what horror she experienced but there is more uh she has some new quotes <clears throat> talking about how it was cult-like and the reason she looks back on that it was cult-like is that half was looked up to as this iconic figure sort of like the head of a cult and she you know wasn't allowed really to have friends over it was frowned upon she had to quit her job as a waitress so there's this big a and e special where she's talking a lot of crap about the playboy mansion and i really just eat up all of the girls next door playboy mansion stuff sarah i know you do too it's just it was such a house of horrors that we did not know even what was happening and it's really interesting to hear it all come out now Oh yeah. You know, I read down the rabbit hole by Holly Madison. Like that was one of the first books I yeah. read. And after that wasn't assigned to me in school in years. Um, cause it was just so <laughs> good. It was so good. Um, and I could never get enough of Holly, like speaking out about it. It just like, I wish, I don't know, I guess I got to watch this documentary. Cause I don't know, besides the like original girls next door and like crystal, obviously who married him, I don't mm-hmm. know that much about like the other girls. So I don't know. I think there's so much there and it definitely is like a cult when you think about it. Cause they were like, they had to dress the same and they were told where, what they could same do. Same boobs, same hair, no friends, no family, no income. A little sure next like- vibes. Well, also That's they were just, you know, in that classic way of segregated away from everybody that they knew and even the life that they knew before. And, you know, obviously this was pre Me Too movement, but hashtag whoa. <laughs> yes. Yeah, with the 2022 lens, it is like very <laughs> emotionally crippling, crippling for women's rights to look back on all of this. Well, let us move on to some other women's rights. These are the rights of Kim Kardashian to be happy in her co-parenting to Kanye West, which seems to be impossible. Um, We've talked about this before, but Kanye is having a little bit of unhinged moments going live on his Instagram two times after not being invited to the joint celebration for his daughter and Kylie Jenner's daughter. Um, And it was... It's just strange because then sources told us that they had planned to do two separate parties and we're wondering, you know, what this is all about. Um, but that's not what I, I want to focus on today. I want to focus on Pete Davidson's new quotes from his stand-up um, Tuesday in New York, a uh, benefit that he did. And he, he's quoted himself to comparing himself to, quote, a discount DVD bin. He said, I'm Tropic Thunder. I'm the diamond in the trash. It's a steal. He was talking about how he gets to date all the famous, most famous, most beautiful beautiful women in the world and that he's like a diamond in the rough it's like a good movie and like that dvd trash ban at your local 7-eleven um we're also hearing reports that pete is really unbothered by kanye's new diss track um 
for the song, My Life Was Never Easy. Um, and in case you didn't know what Kanye said about Pete, he said, God saved me from that crash just so I can beat Pete Davidson's ass. Now, in this Kanye, Pete Davidson hot mess, Gwen Plamberg, what are you feeling about this trifecto tria that is just, you know, coming down fast? I never really know what the true story is between Kim and Kanye and what their relationship is, but they have quite a few children together that they had in rapid succession. And if they are split, they need to, um, you know, shield these kids from any negativity. So I'm hoping that Kanye takes a bit more of the high road and just stops this kind of public lashing of Pete Davidson, who you know, he's just being Pete Davidson <laughs> and somehow he's ensnared Kim Kardashian, no longer Kim Kardashian West. Yeah, I feel like if Kanye really wasn't invited to the birthday party or there wasn't some sort of discussion of a pre, like a plan, like what we heard was that they were having two separate parties. Chicago yeah. was going to be in the afternoon after her party, spent some time with her dad. Um but, and if that was, I believe that that's true because they were posting so much from the party, like Chloe, Kylie, um, Travis Barker's kids were all uploading in like real time. They're not going to get away with it. Yeah. Right. The Kardashians don't even really do that much anymore for like security reasons. They were posting in real time. If it was supposed to be some secret, they wouldn't have had it like where Kanye would know what was going on. So I think maybe Kim doesn't directly communicate always with Kanye if he's really busy. And there was people on Kanye's team who like agreed to this for him. And then he freaked out and his instinct is to go to Hollywood locked. It's to go on Instagram live. And it just made me laugh. Cause he said he called Tristan yeah. to try to get the address of what was going on. And I was like, dude, Tristan is not going to give, he's on the outs. Like clearly you're not reading the news. You're in your own world. Like Tristan's not the guy to call. He eventually got the info from Travis and Kylie, which I wonder, like, I hope the Hulu cameras are up. Like I've said this a thousand times since keeping up has ended in the last eight months, there's been so much that has happened and we don't know when this Hulu show is coming out. We got that like very brief teaser on new year's Eve and there's so much that's going on. And we know Kanye has a new documentary coming out. Like, is that going to include any real personal stuff? Is it mostly music? Like I have a lot of questions that usually would get answered in three to six months because of keeping up with the Kardashians. And I just need guarantee now, Pete, I liked the Tropic Thunder quotes. I thought that was funny. But for me, um, did you guys ever see that movie where Natalie Portman gave birth in a Walmart? Yes. No, but I would have loved to have. Yeah. It's when, called where the, where heart, the heart, heart is or something. Yeah. yeah. Right? And she, she's pregnant. Teenager gives birth in a Walmart. That That's is my right. discount. It's true story. Oh, it is. That is my discount um, bin movie you get at Walmart. So I, maybe I'll work that into his next set. <laughs> that. Okay. It really is a really sweet movie. One of Natalie Portman's first ones. Thanks for reminding us about that, Sarah. I love when you take oh, us back in a little bit of time. <laughs> well, we have like America exclusive... or something. I think she did name the baby America. Yeah. Spoiler alert. Well, you know, we have, you know, exclusive source info alert. Ding, ding, ding. We have heard from a source close to Kim that Kim is very happy with Pete and the Kanye drama is actually bringing them closer together. We have a source say it's not impacting their relationship at all. If anything, the drama is bringing them closer together because he makes things so easy which I totally get makes sense. You're like, my crazy ex is going, this funny guy's here. He's really just chilling, doing absolutely nothing to nobody. Just hanging out. Sounds good for them. Do you know who's not just hanging out? Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. Now there is so much drama to unpack here but let's start with um they could be set to miss a major celebration coming up for prince harry's grandmother i don't know if you heard of her queen elizabeth ii queen of england um because of a dispute with the uk government over their potential security agreements now prince harry is seeking a judicial review of a of, of a decision made by a uk home office that prevents him from paying personally for police protection say that four times fast when he is in britain the dispute could potentially prevent <laughs> prince harry and his family from attending events for his grandmother's platinum jubilee planned for the summer of 2022 um, where they will celebrate elizabeth's 70th year on the throne now the judicial review is an appeal at the country's high court to examine a decision made by a lower court, the Home Office, who is responsible for policing. The Prince Harry's legal team argued in a statement that his own private security would not be adequate to protect his family when he returned to the UK. The quote said, Prince Harry inherited a security risk at birth for life. <laughs> 
Um, it was a very dramatic statement. Um, Prince Harry's legal team had offered to personally pay for the police protection um, in January 2020, but their offer has been dismissed. Now, he was in the country last to unveil a statue of his mother, Princess Diana, and his car was chased by photographers. Of course, that is how the late Princess Di died. So there are a lot of security risks. Sarah Huron, what are your thoughts on this lawsuit and all of this back and forth? I mean, it's confusing to me. I think that if Prince Harry wants to pay for security, he can do so, but I don't necessarily, I think that whatever, like, by le- I don't know, because I mean, he is still Prince Harry. So obviously there's like well, a security. So the, is- the issue is that he can pay for personal security, but he wants them to open up like all of their intelligence to his personal security. He wants to say right. where the queen's going to be moving, where these people are going to be moving. They're like, we don't trust these people from LA. We don't know them. They're not getting our, you know, government secrets, even about the one celebration. Sounds to me like right. a lot of bureaucracy and that pomp and circumstance that, you know, the firm goes by. So I don't think that they're going to be changing their rules just because it's their rules. Now, you know, on one hand, Harry made this choice to leave the royal family and Queen Elizabeth, his grandmother, supported that choice. I think that if he wants to be in the country with his own security detail, I think that the firm and the queen should be um, strongly suggesting to the firm that they need to take every precaution that they need to to make sure that Harry and his family are safe. I don't really think that that's such a big deal. Like I, what I'm finding um, hard to understand is, is this, is this issue as grave like what, what is really happening? Right. What is right. really happening? I mean, heads of state don't give out um, state secrets to, um, you know, non Private securities from LA. They don't. Um, so that's not so difficult to understand that, that that's what's happening. What I want to understand is like, are they really saying to him like, oh, you're out there on your own? I highly right. doubt that too. So it's just a little bit of, of throughout this entire story with Harry leaving the royal family, what are the facts here? And let's take the emotion out of it because everything seems to come from this place of emotion, like they are doing me dirty. I, I, I just don't think that that's the case either. Um, so I just would love to know like the, the real facts. I think- Gwen, you're right. And it's also like, cause it was the same thing in the CVS interview. It like became this, so like, we're never going to have security. We're gonna, like, everything was so like black and white. And then we quickly found out that like, it's not so black and white and things were not adding up. And there's just like so many gray factors on both sides of what was said. And this is another example of that because I don't, I, but I also just think like, what does, what does he really need to know or do? Like, I, I feel like they could find a compromise of what they could share versus what they can't share anymore. Cause like I, part of me, it's like harsh and not nice to say because there are two little kids involved or whatever, but like you signed up for it. Like, this is what you wanted. It's what you agreed to like this. They, I'm sure they were very clear about like what you weren't getting anymore. And it's like hard for me to feel bad. It's hard because I think both sides are so emotional, right? Prince Harry had to watch his mother die by being chased by the paparazzi, which is going to be all over him. So he has, he's like, give me all of the itinerary. Give me all of these trade secrets. I don't care. And then the firm is like, you disgraced the crown. You went on TV and talked trash about all of us. We're not giving you anything. So I but think I both think sides that are the, hurt. Right. Like, I don't think that that's why the firm isn't giving him no, the information no. he wants. They're simply not giving him information that it, it's just not protocol, period. Right. So, right. you know, you can't, again, it's kind of like Harry should have thought all of that through before he so publicly made the decision to leave the royal family. You know, it's, you, you can't have everything the yeah. way you want it. Although I think that Meghan Markle wants everything the way that she wants it, you know, so, and she's going to push and push and push until she gets some semblance of what she wants. You know, it's it's a very, listen, I think that all family dramas, you know, family, think about every family at holidays. Every family has these dramas. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is just obviously magnified to the nth because of this extraordinarily famous family. It sure is. And I hope the queen releases a statement like you said, and she said, and that's 
that's on period. <laughs> She's like, you're not getting these Tuesdays and that's on period. Well, let us move on to a more uh, sobering story than even this. Um, Bob Saget was laid to rest this past week and his good friend, Jeff Ross, said that Bob Saget, quote, had the best funeral ever. <laughs> Jeff Ross said, like Bob, like Bob himself, everything was first class. He wrote an email um, to news outlets. The crowd was star-studded star just the way Bob would have wanted. The next night, we threw him an impromptu rock and roll shiva in the small room above the comedy store in Hollywood where Bob started his career as a teenager. Now, Ross, um, Jeff Ross was a huge a longtime fan of Bob Saget. They were friends for decades and decades and decades, who of course died earlier this month at 65. And his star-studded funeral included guests like Dave Chappelle, Kathy Griffin, Billy Crystal, uh, Jimmy Kimmel, uh, Jonathan Silverman, his wife, Kelly Rizzo, John Mayer, um, and you know, David Coulier and John Stamos from the Full House. <clears throat> um, Jeff Ross and John Mayer went on Instagram while they were driving down the four five picking up um, Bob Saget's car from LAX and they reminisced about Bob and they said Bobby really did take care of everybody if you need a doctor if you need a lawyer if you need a pastrami sandwich at three in the morning because some girl just broke your heart Bob was that guy um, Bob Jeff Ross also said that there will be other tributes he, uh, for comedy fans know that more is coming and his wife was just on GMA Bob Saget's late wife was just on GMA talking about the last half that she sent her husband and she said I was just very grateful that it was I love you so much I love you dearly and he said I love you endlessly I can't wait to see you tomorrow she said through tears but it's really nice that that was the end of um you know their talk together it just sounded to me like Kelly Rizzo and Bob Saget had an incredibly loving relationship and that Bob actually talked the talk and would tell his friends on the daily how much he cared about them. So they're just, you know, I wish there were more Bob Sagets in the world. Sarah Huron, tell us about what is going on with Jamie Lynn Spears and Ooh. Britney's back and forth today. There has been a lot going down. Oh my God. Like, I don't even know where to start. But as we know, Jamie Lynn wrote a book called Things I Should Have Said. And she's promoting this book. She's been on Nightline slash Good Morning America. She was on Call Her Daddy. Um, and she's saying a lot of stories about this alleged knife that Brittany once locked her and Jamie Lynn in a room with and put in a door. She's talking about um, Brittany's quote unquote erratic behavior and episodes she had. She wrote about how Jamie Lynn's big narrative in this book is how nobody cared about her and how she has a voice now and she's not afraid to use it. And she has to teach her daughters to use their voice. There's some hilarious claims about Zoe 101 um, side note in which um, Jamie Lynn alleges that her co-star Alexa, who played Nicole on season one of Zoe 101 before she disappeared, um, started rumors that Jamie Lynn had lice and smelled and Brittany had to defend her. Um, and just like a bunch of stuff about their childhood and a bunch of claims about Brittany and Brittany's not pleased. And while Jamie Lynn has insisted that the book is not about her, um, it has been reported that there is at least 200 mentions of Brittany's name in the book. And that's not counting the word Good reporting. Sister. Nick Hotman, page six. Yes. Great shout reporting. out page six. Nick Hotman yes. and his, <laughs> his counting of Brittany's name in the book. Great job. Um, and things are getting legal. So after Call Her Daddy came out on Tuesday, the same day the book came out, which part one of Call Her Daddy has not been released yet at part two. So I don't know if it's coming out or not, but G uh, Brittany's team sent Jamie Lynn's a cease and desist. And there's some pretty wild lines in here. Well, after, um, but before the cease and desist, Brittany shared that Instagram post where she said she should have slapped her mother and her sister across the face. No, but that was after the cease and desist because that's oh, when I that's why Jamie Lynn's team responded quoting that. Okay, sorry, please. please no, they went back out. and forth all weekend on social, Jamie Lynn and Brittany. It was very much Brittany being like, Jamie Lynn, you, congratulations on your book, babe. Anything to sell books, right? And then Jamie Lynn being like, it's not about you. And then being like, call me, let's talk about this privately. Like they had like a million Instagrams and tweets back and forth. Yeah. Then Brittany's lawyer got involved. This is the lawyer who did get ownership. So we know has Brittany's best interest at heart and quoted, this is, this, this doesn't even read like a real letter um, that... They said, but we want write with some hesitation because the last thing Brittany wants is to get more attention to your ill-timed book and misleading out misleading outrageous claims. Brittany was the family's breadwinner and 
she also otherwise supported you. Public airing of false grievances is wrong, especially when designed to sell books. It is also potentially unlawful and defamatory. Michelle Obama famously said, when they go low, we go high. And to Britney's credit, that is exactly what Britney's going to do for the time being. You recently stated that the book was not about her. She takes you at your word, and therefore we demand that you cease and desist from referencing Britney during your promotional campaign. If you fail to do so or defame her, Britney will be forced to consider and take all appropriate legal action. So Jamie Lynn's lawyer has now responded to Britney's lawyer saying Britney didn't even read the book. Jamie Lynn grew up with the same father. She has her own stories. You say we go low, you go high, but then Britney's out here on Instagram saying she should have slapped Jamie Lynn across the face and their mama Lynn. Um, so super messy. I think, you know, the, the moral of the story here is like, why did Jamie Lynn write this book? She clearly, like, I just don't know what she thought was going to happen. It just makes my heart break over and over again for Britney. It's just so sad. It's all so sad. And um, the pictures that Britney has been posting her have been really um, concerning as well. Uh, yes. <clears throat> yes, so they prayers have. prayers for Britney. She is in the right. Um, but I'm worried. I'm, I'm a little worried as well. The back and forth is just not making anyone look good. It's not making me feel good about anyone. Um, Brittany was back in court today. Um, she won a battle against her dad, Jamie Spears, and the courtroom arguments were very dramatic as well. The, her lawyer was like, you know, saying that her Jamie Spears was spying on Brittany in her bedroom. They had evidence to that and the lawyers were just like yelling at each other and it all feels very dramatized for the camera. Jamie's book, the Instagram back and forth, all parties. It's just, it's all a little crazy. I just yeah. need Britney's point of view edited by someone else in book or Netflix series form to, you know, tell us what has happened. I was going to say, I need a third party like investigator or something because like in certain court documents I'm reading, you know, it says that Britney was giving financial support to Jamie Lynn and that's like a huge yeah. thing. And then Jamie Lynn always denies that. And she, I listened to the whole call her daddy episode and she, Jamie Lynn does this thing where she's like super strong in her convictions. But then when she's asked a follow-up question, she suddenly doesn't remember. So like the stories are very inconsistent. Like she has a narrative that's trying to sell, but then when someone questions it, she's like, well, I was, I was five. I don't know. It's like, but you just made like a very strong claim about something that happened like the day before you're not like, so it's a little right. inconsistent. Um, I'm not saying that growing up as Jamie Lynn Spears was easy growing up as Britney Spears certainly wasn't easy. Um, and these parents are just not it, obviously. And like, what's where's Brian come into this? There's a lot more that I need. So I need another documentary. Um, but I also just want like Brittany and to go live in peace. So it's like, I don't know. It's messy. Yeah. But you know, I'm gonna thank Sarah anyway, even though she was frozen for the last one, and Gwen for helping me spill all of this piping hot celebrity this week. Again, this is Travis Cronin, Us Weekly's Hot Hollywood Podcast, with your weekly peek into the glimmer, glitter, fashion, and fame of your favorite celebrities. Because after all, they're, they're just, just like, like us. us. Except with more money and access. Thank you guys so much. We will be back next week for a new episode. See you then.